بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين. All praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa taala. We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and we ask Allah to bless his household, his companions, and all of us seated here, the ummah at large and humanity at large. Amen. My brothers and sisters, the theme of this tour is healing the ummah. You've just seen a few videos that were played showing you some of the bleeding within the ummah. And I'm sure you'd appreciate that one of the plans of Allah Almighty is to create challenges within our lives, every single one of us. So if you're seated here today, I guarantee you that every single one of you faces has faced, is facing, shall face challenges. I need to heal from the wounds that I have. So many things have happened to me and continue to happen to me that are negative. And the same applies to all of us, but the positives in the case of most of us eclipse the negatives. So I have so much goodness happening that you know what? The little bad is by the way. Yes, injury occurs. Yes, I may be bleeding, but it probably is a pinprick and I see perhaps a droplet of blood. Yes, I may be feeling the pain and it might unsettle me. But guess what? Like I said, in the case of most of us, because Allah has blessed us with favor upon favor upon favor that is so massive, we don't really feel the pain regarding ourselves. And if it is, it's temporary, it's short, it's limited, it's manageable, manageable. But Allah Almighty has kept it such that there is not a single one of us that can say, I've never faced a challenge in my life, never had hardship, never been sick or ill. I'm, I've just had a smooth sailing life with everything the way I want it. Not one of us can say that. Because that's the plan of Allah. <laughs> Allah promises using emphasis in the wording, saying, I promise you in this, it does not include a promise of Allah, but the wording itself is a promise. Where he says, I will definitely, I will indeed test all of you with a few things. And I've mentioned this in many talks, even on this tour. So without going into all the things that Allah has mentioned, the point is Allah has made it clear he is going to test every one of us. In fact, he says, if you're a believer and you say, I believe, then we will test you even more. Wow. One might ask why I'm a believer. I'm a believer. I do good. I pray five times a day. I give charity. I fast in Ramadan, I've been for Hajj, I go for Umrah, I dress appropriately, I don't lie and deceive and steal and cheat, I've got good character and conduct, I don't do things that will displease Allah, but I'm still struggling. Well, you're struggling because those are the challenges Allah promises you are going to come in your direction when you say I'm a believer, when you declare your faith. Surah Al Ankabut, right at the beginning, Allah says, do people think does man think that it is sufficient to just say that i'm a believer and then you will not be tested when you say you're a believer you will be tested allah says we have indeed tested 
We have even tested those before you in order for us to distinguish or in order to distinguish those who are truthful from those who are not. And that's why when someone comes and says, I want to say my shahada, mashallah, we're excited. And they say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu anna Muhammadan abdu wa rasuluh. That's the beginning of challenges they're going to face one after the other. Do you know why? Let me give you a simple explanation. They have now enrolled in the college. And when you've enrolled, the examinations of the college are for you, not for those who are outside the college. The ones who are outside can enjoy and do whatever. They probably would be either on the streets or either involved in some other form of business or whatever it may be. The fact that you chose to enroll yourself in this college, every test that the college has, you're going to have to write it in order to graduate to the next level. That's the reason why the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, says, Inna Allaha idha ahabba abdan ibtala. When Allah loves a soul or a slave, he then tests them. He tests them. One of the signs of the love of Allah is that you have a challenge upon a challenge upon a challenge. Hardship upon hardship upon hardship. Perhaps what we term calamity upon calamity upon calamity. It's a sign of the love of Allah. How do I know? Well, if you're content and you're okay and you're managing and your faith keeps you going and your connection with Allah keeps growing, then that's the best thing that could have happened for you. If a challenge and a difficulty makes you grow in your relationship with Allah, isn't that a good thing? But even if your ease distances you from Allah, that's a bad thing. Allah's blessed you, so now you're driving in the most comfortable car. You have the most amazing scent. You actually have so much of goodness, subhanAllah. And if that drifted you away from Allah, I promise you, it was not a good thing. It's not a nice thing. So Allah says, now that you've enrolled, now that you've believed, we will test you. And when we love you, we will test you. And one more thing, we heard that already. But the greater reward comes with the greater test. Were you patient? How Allah tested you with something big. Your reward is far greater than mine. When Allah tested me with something small, exactly the example of the college I said moments ago, you don't just go on a street outside the college, hey guys, and you're looking at random people walking on the platform or on the pavement and say, come here, we have an O-level exam, we'd like you to write it. They look at you and say, are you mad, man, are you crazy? They won't write the exam, they did not enroll in the college. And then when you've enrolled, there are small tests and small exams. They bring about small qualifications. Then you have the major one that will qualify you to go into the next level, which here we say year eight, year nine, year 10, year 11. If you failed one of them, what happens? You'll go back. It was a big test. You didn't pass it. Why is it that we enjoy that? We work towards it, we work hard, and we know we're going to be tested, and we know that we're going to have to have passed the massive tests in order to get to the next level when it comes to worldly items like O levels and A levels and what have you. But when it comes to Allah, who told you almost the same thing, but of a higher example, then we find ourselves dilly dallying and we don't realize that, you know what, I was always going to be tested. The minute you declare your shahada, people will say things, your family might have something to say, someone else will have a few things to say Muslims themselves will put so much of pressure on you as though you're supposed to be a saint the first day hang on guy I just said my shahada I'm still going to slowly learn things you guys have been Muslims for the last 50 years and you're not practicing properly I've been a Muslim for five minutes and you're mowing me down as though I'm supposed to be practicing every rule I'm still going to learn I always tell those who revert to Islam don't let the people put pressure on you Go easy. And as you learn, put into practice. As you learn, put into practice. But one of the biggest letdowns is when you allow the pressure to stress you. Oh, they're saying this, they're saying that. And that's why sometimes when I see brothers and sisters online and they're declaring the shahada, I'm waiting for people in the comments to bombard. 
but you have a tattoo but you're not yet doing this and but you have to do the hang on all of you suddenly became madrasa teachers and all of you when you were in madrasa you didn't like your teachers so now what happens they probably won't like you the brothers or the sisters just reverted give them some time it took you 15 years before you could actually put on hijab and you want them to put it on in 15 minutes that's how it is i'm not reducing the importance of hijab yes it's a teaching of islam but all i'm saying is sometimes some people take a little bit of time to come to where they are supposed to all of us aren't we all work in progress i am i promise you there are characteristics qualities and things i'd like to do in my life to bring me even closer to allah that i have not yet done i'm talking about myself we were talking about tahajjud the other day and I said, you know, tahajjud is a prayer. Is it compulsory? No, it's not. Tahajjud is not compulsory. It's a prayer. It's a voluntary prayer that can be said or read or fulfilled or prayed prior to Fajr. Before the time of Fajr comes in. It's not compulsory, but Allah loves it so much that after the compulsory prayers, and the witr, that is probably, that is the most important one. And I said, tahajjud is a prayer that Allah Almighty chooses whom he wants to fulfill it. So tahajjud is by invite only. That's what it is. It's by invite only. If Allah has invited you for it, you will fulfill it. If you have not fulfilled it, you were not invited. That's a prayer, tahajjud. So if you've ever gotten up prior to fajr and some urge has come within you to say, let me just wash, make wudu, and let me do some tahajjud, whether it's two or four or six or eight units, let me do tahajjud. You need to know that Allah has selected you and chosen you. That's why you are there. And sometimes Allah invites you by virtue of a problem he put in your life. It's a massive thing. And I say, I'm going to get up for tahajjud and cry. It was Allah saying, I love you. I want to do something to you in a way that you're going to get up tomorrow morning for an invite only act of worship. Subhanallah. So anyway, when I was mentioning this, this is all part of healing the ummah. So when you have issues, this is also one of the ways of healing. You know, we get up and we extra prayer for Allah and inshallah we, we will reap the benefit of it. But the point I wanted to raise was people thought in the crowd, and a young lad came up to me and this is why I say and I repeat that if I'm encouraging you to do tahajjud it does not mean that I'm a regular on it this guy must be so holy so pious well I eat all the steak pies so yeah pious but in all honesty we are trying yes we try sometimes we do it and a lot of the times we don't it's a voluntary prayer but i still need to encourage everyone because you know what by encouraging others you know you get a full reward of everyone who did it as a result of that encouragement so i'm probably in the best business why did i decide to join abdullah aid as an ambassador because of the same reason when I started seeing people giving millions and so much and mashallah, you know, we, we, we raised money to, for the homes of the homeless, for food for those who don't have it, for clothing of those who didn't have, for medicine for those who were struggling. And I told myself, you know what? Allah promises that you who encouraged others gets an equivalent reward as theirs. I said, well, I'm in it. So when I see people putting up the hand, yeah, 25,000, 10,000, 15,000, 500, 200, 300, 50 quid, I tell myself, <coughs> and write it down, you there as well. Wallahi, I'm convinced on the day of judgment, we'll see it. And Allah has given me an opportunity to travel many countries in order to do the charitable work, not because I'm in charge, not because I control anything, but just as a person who supervises, oversees, gives some guidance, advice, throws in a thing or two, and would like to encourage others to do the same and showcase the good work of upright people who are doing it in a thorough, proper way. So I ended up going in totally as a volunteer, and then when I was asked if I would be the ambassador, I said, yes, I will. You get a reward. It doesn't mean I spent, nor does it mean I'm rich. We're all rich in our own ways, you know, but not wealthy. No. But people who just look at you and see Abdullah Aid and you're coming and you're giving this and that. And imagine the poor people looking at you and say, this guy must be so loaded. Look at what he's doing. 
But they don't realize it was the people of Hounslow who gave, mashallah. They gave, and here I am. But we're doing it on your behalf. We're doing it on your behalf. And one of the most beautiful things, one of the most amazing things, is when you see an old lady shedding tears in the middle of a desert, in a makeshift home, and praying for a donor from Hounslow, whom she will never meet, who will never meet her, who may never know one another, who has sent for her clothing or food or given her some shelter or helped to drill a well or a borehole for her. And here she is benefiting from the blanket in the biting winter. Oh Allah, help whoever has helped me. Oh Allah, grant whoever has granted me. Protect them, their family members, their loved ones. Grant them goodness, health, wealth, save them from calamity and the du'as go on and on and on and i'm thinking subhanallah with her tears are my tears and i'm watching and i'm thinking to myself i remember raising funds and i even remember some of those who raised their hands if i had a video to show the sister or, or, or the, the lady the elderly lady that look when we went out to london and we told people are you ready to assist and we were talking about you, my beloved mother. They immediately put up their hands and they said, you know what, we're going to be there without knowing you, without ever thinking that you would be rattling out so many du'as for them with tears in your eyes because for them it was just something small. But for those who received it, it was life-changing. Healing the ummah. Congratulations. Every one of you who's attended today, by virtue of you purchasing a ticket, you've already supported the same lady and the likes of her. Because the proceeds go to charity. People say, I wonder how much Mufti Menk charges for an event. You can hear it here and now. Zero. If anything, I would pay to facilitate something that happened from my own pocket. We don't need that money. We'd like to give. So whatever the rumors might be on earth, leave it be. People say, why don't you respond? I have sometimes, like what I did today. But we have a limited life. I have a few days left on earth. And so do you. In this short time, I want to pack away as many good deeds as I can, in as many ways as I can, so that when I leave this place, I've had, I, I would have sown as many seeds as possible that will bring back to me a reward even after I've died. Life is limited. But if I'm going to spend it responding this one, the other one, the other one, Someone was telling me, you know, you probably have about a million people who talk rubbish about you. I said, you know, it would take me 12,000 years to respond to each one of them. What on earth? Meaning a long, long time, by the way. May Allah Almighty grant us ease. So healing the ummah, healing the ummah by reaching out to them. But going back to what we were saying right at the beginning, do you know every one of us needs to heal as well? I need to heal. You need to heal. How do we heal? Point number one, develop a connection with your maker. Make sure that he is the first port of call. You have a problem. Oh Allah, help me. Ask him again. Ask yourself, how can I improve myself? I'm going to change this and this and this for the better. What bad can I leave that I am doing? I'm going to quit this and this and this for the better. Then you see the help of Allah coming. And sometimes then you may not see directly the help of Allah. Allah leaves you for a while because what do you need to do now? Part of plugging in with Allah is to cry to him, to cry to him and be consistent and thank him for putting you in, into a situation where it helped change your life for the better. Many people found the masjid and they found prayer and they found goodness and they found charitable causes after a huge calamity came in their direction. Abdullah aid itself was life-changing for the founder. 
Abdullah aid itself was life changing after the death of his son. May Allah unite all of us in Jannah. Abdullah aid brought the man to the masjid, brought the man to charitable causes. And today in so many countries across the globe, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of them have benefited as a result of what Allah did to one child by taking his life away. Abdullah. And we are here today. Hounslow, would that child ever have dreamt that because of my death, my father's going to go ahead and start helping so many people. And then there will be people from across the globe who are going to help him. My family is going to change. Everyone's going to be, everyone's going to be much happier anticipating meeting me in the hereafter. Healing the Ummah. Allah will heal the Ummah in his own unique way. Call out to Allah. Cry to him. Don't underestimate. And when something comes to you, you have no control over. And it is a calamity. First things first, thank Allah. Why? Number one, a believer is taught to always consider the fact that it could have been worse. Major car accident. We lost three relatives, three family members. Oh Allah, I thank you that it wasn't all five. At least two survived. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. And I ask you to grant those who passed on the rank of martyrdom, sicknesses, terminal illness, cancer it may be, and so on. I remember a brother coming to me saying, you know what, I contracted AIDS. I said, my brother, I'm so sorry. I gave him a big hug and I told him, I don't know. I want to tell you, he says. I said, I don't need to know. He says, I want to tell you. But I want to ask you a question or two. Healing the ummah. You could have AIDS, you could have whatever. I'm here to be of help. I'm here to help you heal. I don't care where you've been. Where you've been is your past. And the brother told me, I am a hafiz. Memorize the Quran. One day, I did an act that didn't last more than a minute. Six months down the line, I started feeling unwell. And I traveled to a certain country. One of the requirements of the visa was that you need to have an AIDS test. And I tested positive and I froze. I knew where it came from and I've never done it one, more than once in my life. But the question I have for you is, will Allah forgive me? May Allah grant him Jannah, he passed on. We used to call him Al-Hafif. After that, I used to call him Al-Hafif. And the circle of friends, we used to call him Al-Hafif. The reason is, reminding him about the good he's done. He's a Hafif, he did a lot of good. I told him, Habibi, Allah's probably already forgiven you. And each time you ask Allah's forgiveness, your status is being elevated because forgiveness is the very first time you said, Oh Allah, forgive me. It was already wiped out. Now when you think of it again, you say, Oh Allah, forgive me. Do not say it because you're doubting the initial forgiveness of Allah, but you say it because you want your status to be elevated in the eyes of Allah. The example is if I did something bad to you, it turns out you're a really nice person. And mashallah, one day I get to know you a little bit and you subhanallah, I look at you and say, please forgive me, man. You know, I did this. Oh, it was you who did that. Okay. I see anyway, you're forgiven. Don't worry. Not to mention, right? And you see me three days later, you look and because of how bad the thing was, you know, I told you it's okay and you're forgiven, but you look at me and say, hey man, forgive me. You know, I feel so bad. Every time I look at you and I think of it, just forgive me, man. I'm not saying it because you didn't forgive me, but because I remembered it again. And you say, no, it's okay, man. And then each time you see me again, you say, you know what, I, I feel so bad. What? Relax, calm down. It's okay. It's okay. In our language, chill, man. But in the eyes of Allah, the first time you sought forgiveness, you were forgiven. After that, don't doubt the mercy of Allah. That's shaitan's plot to come and make you think what I did was really, really bad. And if Allah forgave you, you may have to live with the consequences of what you did. Someone chops their hand off someone, for example, typical example, you tattoo yourself with permanent tattoos, which is which Islam does not allow. 
And so you come up with these permanent tattoos, mashallah. You either converted to Islam or reverted, or what you did is you, you asked Allah's forgiveness because you realized you did it in your jahiliya. I had a major problem being a counselor of someone, let's not say the gender, someone who tattooed the name of their partner in a very awkward place and so what happened and it's a true story i tell you because out of love some people do things with crazy they don't realize listen this is out of it do not do this they broke up after some time this person ends up getting married mashallah tabarakallah lo and behold each time they see somebody's name down there and they're wondering what's going that is absurd but i want to tell you healing the ummah shouldn't someone like myself address the person to say it's not the end of the world it's not the end of the world mistakes happen you pay a price yes you do you pay but we are here to help you heal inshallah we will tell you allah will forgive you human beings may not forgive you it's a problem So this brother who came to me passed on some time later, but he became a beautiful brother. He told me, can I be Imam? Can I actually be Imam? I said, why not? Why not? I mean, what happened in the past is the past. Today you might have the syndrome and you might know you're terminally ill, but you're the Imam. It's okay. Come, you lead us. And I know for a fact this brother was so remorseful that probably his toba was more than all of ours in sincerity. And I told him at that time when this had happened, medication for that particular virus was not as good as it is today. Today you could live a lifetime, meaning much longer. And I told him, my brother, do you know how favored you are? You're a person who has a terminal illness. It's as though Allah is giving you time to say, just prepare because you're coming back to us in a short time it is better than one who suddenly goes and they were not prepared or they were doing something devilish or, or wrong may Allah forgive all of us and grant us a beautiful wonderful death you want to die in salah in sujood let me ask you the question how many of you would love to die while you were praying in sujood put up your hands there we go all of us well if you don't pray what's the probability of that right so then pray, pray more often. Pray often and the chances of you dying in sujood increase tremendously, common logic. So the brother then became an imam. Like I said, we called him al-hafiz. Started helping others and helping them heal because do you know what? A mistake that your child, my child, you or I, for example, anyone else may have made does not define you it's a mistake do you acknowledge it was a mistake yes i do it doesn't define you subhanallah it's actually the favor of allah when it brought you closer to him no matter what it was and you die in a condition where you know i am in the best state i ever was never in my history was i fulfilling so much of salah and was i doing so much so what i'm saying connect with allah it will help you heal pray to him cry to him and sometimes Allah leaves it for a long while because he loves the condition you're in right now. You're crying. You're in tears. You actually have softened. Allah says, I love this condition so much. I'm going to keep you like this for one more year. One more year. Now you're struggling. No job. I can't find a job. It's been a year. It's been two years. It's been three years. Allah saying, I love the way you cry to us. You've softened. You've become a better person. You've quit your habits and so on. How many of us, the minute we start, we get a job. We get a nice, beautiful salary. We've got a little bit of excess cash. And we start thinking of how to sin with that cash. It happens. Because that's shaitan coming and telling you, you got a lot. Come on, let's go to the club once. Club. You got the cash. You got the money. <laughs> that's not it shaitan shaitan is really working hard if he doesn't come to you one way he comes to you the other way that excess cash is why we are here today we want to guide you to help others heal because one of the ways you will heal in your small matters which will be dwarfed by the matters of the others 
yet their lives are led in a more content fashion than our own. But one of the ways you will heal is to reach out to those who need healing. And what do they need healing from? So many challenges, so many issues, so many problems, so much, subhanallah. Allah will use you when he loves you to reach out to others. When Allah put it in your heart, ah, you know what, this is a cause. Let me give five dollars, five pounds. The amount is not of much relevance. What is of greater relevance is your sincerity. Even if you haven't given a figure because you couldn't or you've given elsewhere, can't you say a good prayer? Aren't we as an ummah, part of our healing is to be genuine towards one another. I see you suffering a loss. Wallahi, I feel it. Even if I didn't get along with you well, or I don't know you, or I didn't like you. But when I see you suffering a loss, I feel it. I say, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. May Allah help the brother and the sister. The most difficult thing to do is when someone you really dislike with a passion goes through difficult times is to pray for them and to wish them well. That's not easy. Try it. It's very rewarding. Because a lot of us, when someone is struggling and because we dislike them with a the passion, we say, yeah, serves you right. Minimum, right? Alhamdulillah, my, uh, my dua, my prayer is answered. Why? They're suffering. Sorry, I'm not pointing at the sisters intentionally. <laughs> Let me just do this, okay? So that's, you know, I know when you're hurt and you're oppressed and someone's done wrong, Allah may deal with that person and he, prob and he does. But you shouldn't wish for someone that, you know what? evil befalls them rather as a believer wish goodness oh allah i've had a major problem with this person soften their hearts help them guide them and let us become friends once again oh that's a tough one you're thinking of a few i can think of a few names actually of people i wouldn't like that for meaning it's okay i've forgiven i don't hold it in my heart but i wouldn't like to have much to do with them ever again once bitten twice shy that's an islamic teaching a true believer is never bitten from the same source or the same hole twice. And this is why Islam does not preach forgive and forget. It preaches forgive but do not forget. Did you ever know that? It says forgive but bear it in mind so that they don't bite you from the same angle again. And guess what? If Allah wants you to forget, the healing will come and you become so close that you actually forget certain things that happen. That's Allah will make you forget. It's not in your hand. I'm a human. I can't forget what you did, but I've forgiven you. You're my brother. I'm going to give you a chance. And mashallah, I'll get along with you and we're going to whatever. But I'm a human. I can't forget it. It was really nasty. That's an Islamic teaching, you know. You hear that? Why? By virtue of the hadith I just read for you. With the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, says a true believer is not bitten from the same source twice. So I, I, I forgive, but I'm going to bear it in mind because I need to protect myself. And if it becomes very toxic, I can stay away. And I can say, oh Allah, for purposes of this world, you know what, I've forgiven this person. It's okay, fine. Some people actually, I've heard one brother say, and he asked me if it was okay to say that. And I said, you could have said anything because it's up to you. You can forgive or not forgive. If someone wrongs you, you have the right to say, I don't want to forgive this person. When they were going for Hajj, they went to visit someone and he said, look, my brother, I'm going for Hajj. Please forgive me. He says, I don't want to forgive you. He says, but I'm going for Hajj. He says, I don't care. You can go for Hajj or you can go for Baj, whatever it might be. So I told the brother, I said, why did you wrong him in the first place? It's his right. It's his right to say, I don't want to forgive you. The guy says, but I'm going for Hajj. What is Hajj? Hajj. Does that suddenly give you a right to go to everyone you've actually wronged in a big way and say, going for Hajj guys, that's over, I'm coming back clean, clean slate, clean slate between you and Allah, you owe the guy a million bucks, you still owe him when you come back from Hajj. In fact, if you owe him, you're not supposed to have gone for the Hajj, use that money and give the guy. There we are. So don't come and use your psycho here on us. We're helping the Ummah heal. So when you've wronged someone, what did you do? Exactly the opposite. And if you did that and the person comes along, we might encourage him, just forgive. 
I've had people tell me, you don't even know what they did. Don't even come and try. Yesterday, someone gave me a note and in it was some detail of what happened in their own marriage. And he expects me to now call the wife, for example, this is a true one, but it happens so often and to fight his case when I don't know him, I don't know her and I look like a fool. I'm going to phone her and say, forgive your husband, give him another chance. What? I wouldn't do that if I would and I will contact her this is who I am if you feel you'd like to speak to me let me know is that not fair I only want to hear your side of the story because I've heard the other side I'm not here to take sides I'd like to see if we are able to help you guys heal if you're interested full stop salam isn't that fair how can I suddenly come and shove down your throat you have to you're gonna to go to Jahannam because you're not solving the problem Do you know your children are gonna suffer sometimes children suffer more when the parents are together if they're fighting like cats and dogs every single day so divorce is discouraged very strongly but it's permissible people say we're staying together just because of the children but I haven't slept with this guy for the last 12 years yes it's a reality it's a fact my brother you're supposed to have divorced for the sake of the children let them grow up in a healthy environment where mom and dad can smile at each other exchange beautiful words when they grow older and they need to get married they won't know what needs to be done i always say learn to be behaving in a way that you'd like your children to behave with their spouses because it's a circle and it goes on and on and on and on and it's something that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, spoke about when he said the best from amongst you are those who are best to their family members. Do you know one of the reasons is it is a very delicate matter to raise children. And when they watch you, they mimic you by the will of Allah and by his instruction and inspiration. A child before they can talk, they're already mimicking their parents. That's from Allah, not from you. So Allah says, you know what? The best from amongst you are those who are best in that circle. The reason is, you're going to be bringing up the future generations. One of the reasons. So if I really don't see eye to eye, everything is a fight and a war and I don't even show any form of sweetness to my spouse, it's time to just say goodbye. You know what? We didn't get along. I might get along better with someone else. Go and study the lives of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Some of them have actually gone to some other, said, you know what? I divorced her. She wasn't good for me, but I'm telling you, she's a good person for you. Well, in our age, probably that would be like a punishment, you know, which is good for you. What do you mean? What do you mean? You know, but they, they, they meant well, they meant well. Brothers and sisters, you know, it's very sad what's happening. But at the same time, I'm a person. I see lots of hope, lots of hope. The ummah, inshallah, is developing. We have numbers that are entering the fold of Islam. We have people who are learning how to reach out to others, people who are helping one another. You see someone, think about good things. Don't just look at someone and immediately look at all the negatives. Think of the positives. So much of positivity that we have. Everywhere I've been, wherever we've spoken about charitable causes, wallahi, little children have come up and said, you know what, I'd like to give something. Or I'm going to be making a dua for those people because I, I was so sad to see them in this condition. And you, you tell yourself, alhamdulillah, oh Allah, You've used us to do a little bit of good just accept it from us just accept it from us so you want to heal you need to help others heal and if you want to help them heal you're going to need to be a very very calm person you're going to need to listen and understand i did not know any better before i began to interact with people and travel and see and ask and find out and look at people and their struggles and listen to what problems they have now i appreciate everything because i've seen a lot in life we fuss about the exact drink that we would like i don't want to go into details but you know you enter into a restaurant here in central London and what do you do? Mashallah, it's not wrong. You order something so specific like there's five different descriptions of the type of virgin mojito you'd like. That word was never heard by people somewhere who are just waiting for a droplet of water. 
that is drinkable because they're drinking that which looked like tea. Wallahi, I've been to places where the water that they drink looks like tea. And we're sitting fighting about this and that. It's not wrong. You want to pay, you enjoy it. Allah gave you. But remember, each time you take a little bit out and give it to others, see how you heal. Each time, well, I do certain things, but let me not talk about what I do. Let me encourage everyone, myself included. Each time you go out and spend 50 pounds on food, it's not compulsory, but I'm just encouraging you. Take out a pound, two pounds or five pounds and put it in a little box or in your tin. Do you know just the amount of food we waste is enough to feed all, all those who don't have food on earth? That's, that's my idea. The reason is you watch people and whether they're ordering food or whether they're sometimes eating at home, the amount of edible food that is thrown into the bins is so big so huge that you tell yourself other people need one or two morsels to survive to survive they would do anything to have that and here you have thrown it i remember going to one of the far east asian countries and there was a restaurant called and I won't forget this name. It's called Tupai Tupai. It's called Tupai Tupai. And they had a little notice as you enter because it was a buffet system. You go in and pay X amount and buffet. And it says, you pay so much and on your exit, they weigh your plate and you per 100 grams, you pay X amount because of how much food you've wasted. You see, because when you have a buffet, a lot of people, you just go in, you take your plate, you fill as much as you want, and you fill more than what you want, and you fill three times what you want, and, and, and your plate looks like you've never seen food before. That's just because I just made one payment and I can eat what I want. No problem. Eat it. Thank you. <laughs> if you're not going to eat it, you deserve to be fined, and that's what they do. So we're going to charge you more if you leave food in your plate. Please eat it. Brilliant. I went and actually congratulated the manager. And he says, you know how much people complain? You're coming to thank me. I asked him a very bad question, but I can tell you what it was. I said, can you tell me who are the people who, leave, who waste food the most? Wallahi, he told me something that I don't want to share with you. Because it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. You can imagine, right? Because subhanallah, let's think about others. I... On the other hand, when I went to Qatar and we were served food in big trays, the whole lamb and a lot of rice and so many other things. And, I, and there were so many of them because, and there were a few of us, but so many. And I told the brother, what's going to happen to this food? He says, do you know what? Did you notice the truck outside? I said, yes. He said, that's the intercontinental. They are waiting there. As soon as we're done, they're going to pick up everything that's here, whatever is edible. They will take it. They will pack it into proper packs, heat it properly, keep it as a solid meal, give it with, the, with whatever else has been left over to those who don't have. That day I said, the world has changed, mashallah, for a good, for a good, in a good way. Imagine, they're paying for someone to make it such that they're going to pack parcels and take it on to those who don't have. And that's why we say, first time I came to London was in, you want to know when? First time I came to London, I got married, mashallah. Let me just say in the 1990s. Okay. By the way, mashallah, alhamdulillah. Those of you who know, mashallah. <laughs> so, when I first came and I saw people, I saw people throwing food in the bin. And I said, why did you do that? I said, but who are we going to give it to? At that time, there were no, perhaps not as much, not as many refugees and so on and whatever it might be. And people were probably okay. And I was shocked because I come from Africa. Even if you leave one grape 
Someone's going to eat that. You can, at the traffic light, you can give a guy a grape. Wallahi, he'll eat it and say, ah, so sweet, so nice. You feel like giving him, again, one grape. It happens to this day. In a respectful way. You don't throw things at people. But in my heart, I said at the time that, you know what? These people are so unfortunate. They don't even have poor to give it to. And I was a young lad in my 20s. And subhanallah, I remember the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, wherein he said that a time will come close to the end when there will be nobody to receive your zakat. Because everybody will be wealthy. Everybody will have wealth. So no one will be able to take your wealth. And that's a sign of the hour, the end of times. I mentioned that in the masjid years ago. A young guy comes to me and says, I can't wait for that time. I need money. And I said, look at how each brain takes what is suitable for it in such a way that the point I'm raising is how fortunate we are to be able to give. And he's saying, hey, we're all going to be rich. Yo, that's, that's going to be a good time, man. Crazy. So when Allah gives you, consider yourself fortunate to be able to give because if Allah willed and wanted, wallahi, he did not need anyone to give anyone else. He would have provided them in the same way he's provided others. Like the ants and the creatures, Allah provides. And Allah has provided. He doesn't need you and I. Same way, he doesn't need you and I. If you don't give, someone else will give. The project will continue. The poor person is still going to live for as long as Allah wants them to live. If you didn't give, someone else gave. And if someone else didn't give, Allah will show them. Allah will give them, guide them. They may see something. Subhanallah, did you read the story about some of those young people who, who were on an island not too long ago and they survived so many days, these little kids, and the mother passed away. I don't know if you saw the story in the news. I did. And how did they survive? They survived on anything and everything. Yes, they lost weight and everything happened, but they were alive and okay 40 days later. It was Allah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness and help us heal. May Allah Almighty use us to help others heal. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us vehicles of goodness. And inshallah, this tour, healing the ummah, will continue. We have a few more days. Today we're here in Hounslow. We have a few masjid events, which means it will be in the masjid. It's unique. One of the reasons why we chose to have different settings is in order to cater for different categories of people as well. Not everyone would be so comfortable in the masjid, for example, because I know young people who say, no, when I go there, they say this and do this. I don't even want to come. Okay, it's a mistake on someone's side or maybe more than one person's side, but We'll facilitate for you too. You can come. Feel comfortable here. You're, you're my brother. You're my sister. It's fine. You need to be comfortable and you need to be welcome. That's what you are. And at the same time, it's an opportunity to hear a good word of encouragement so that it can help you improve the quality of your own life and at the same time, reach out to others to help improve the quality of their lives, thus earning the pleasure of Allah. And ultimately earning paradise with ease. Aqulu qawli hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabina